right, folks. Uh, welcome to week six. We've made it this far. Uh, so just to clarify here, by this time, everyone should have the uh, classical argument turned in. Uh, just as a reminder, you do have a one week grace period. So if you have not finished that up, uh, you have until the end of this week to turn it in without any penalty. Uh, but after that, you'll have to incur a 4% penalty per week uh, that it's late. Okay, so get it in by the end of this week at the latest. In the meantime, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next <clears throat> type of rating we're going to be doing, and that's the evaluative argument. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk about this. What is an evaluative argument? At its simplest, an evaluative argument is a review, giving an opinion on the quality based on your own criteria of the subject. Now, evaluations have more in common with strong response essays than they do with traditional persuasion, in that they require minimal research. You have to be at least be familiar with what's being evaluated. The persuasive nature of an evaluation makes it different from a typical movie or restaurant review that simply note the good points and bad points of the thing being evaluated. Okay? So, what we're mainly talking about here is a evaluative essay is going to be something that rates something's quality, but it's not going to be just on the surface quality. There has to be a little bit more in-depth uh, thinking when it comes to this. Uh, one of the big things that we're going to be talking about here is creating lists of criteria and what makes something good. So you're going to be judging your subject based on whether it's good or bad based on those criteria. Okay. I would personally note though that uh, the persuasive nature of evaluation making it different than a movie or restaurant review, that may be no longer the case, especially in the case of media reviews. Uh, they almost always take a side now. Okay, so uh, you have to try to consider what your uh, argument is going to be, what side of you are going to take, what your criteria are going to be, how you're going to judge quality. Okay? <clears throat> so, as a bit of a warm up, uh, I'm going to give you a chance to do a little bit of evaluation on your own. We're going to actually post this two questions to the professor. Uh, ignore what it says about being teams. Okay, uh, we're going to have each of, each of you try to do this on your own, just to get to the hang of uh, what you want to do in terms of evaluation. Okay, now a previously, used text, a previously used textbook for this class presented an example of comparing cell phones, which was, well, let's be honest, it's really quite dated. Uh, the most advanced phone that they uh, listed was an iPhone 3. Uh, and the other phones, one of them was the indestructible Nokia, one of them was a jitterbug phone, and the other one was a uh, Motorola Razor, okay, a flip phone, <clears throat> okay? We're going to be doing an updated version of that here, okay? Now, this is what I want you guys to do here, to try to give you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of valuation. We're going to run a comparison, okay? So, I want you to, what I want you to do real quick is research some of the features uh, on an iPhone and some of the features on an Android phone. Okay, if you can do the research uh, as quickly as you can. Okay, uh, even better if you happen to have, uh, if you have a smartphone and you have the, you know the features intimately for one or the other. That's going to help you. Then all you need to do is research the other one. Okay. Now the question here is which pro, which phone do you prefer and why? Okay. And then, for the following people, which phone would you recommend, okay, based on uh, what you have found out about the Android phone or about the iPhone and what you know about the phone that you currently own, okay? Now, I will say that because there are several manufacturers of Android phones, for the purposes of this uh, exercise, the Android phone that you're looking for for these people is a, the most recent version of the Samsung Galaxy, okay? So, yeah, for these four individuals, which phone would you recommend and why? Okay. So, uh, the individuals in particular, uh, first one is a grandmother trying to keep in touch with her family. Okay. So, uh, think about what that grandmother is going to need, uh, what she's really going to be able to comprehend, what she's going to be able to handle in terms of technology. Uh, a freshman starting college. 
same fail. What, what are they going to be able to handle? What kind of stuff do they actually need? Uh, single mother who needs to be in contact with her work consistently. Okay. And then finally, a family of four looking for multiple phones to keep in touch at all times. Okay. And that last one, you're probably going to be looking at, in addition to everything else, you're also going to be looking at terms of value. Uh, in terms of how, what's the best deal that they can get for multiple phones. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give you uh, a little longer for this one. I've mostly been giving you 10 minutes lately. Uh, let me give you about 20 to do this uh, to do this exercise. Uh, and post your res post your responses to the thread I'm setting up at questions to the professor. Okay. So basically, which of these phones do you prefer? And for those four situations, which phone would you recommend? Okay, uh, take about uh, 20 minutes to do this and uh, res we'll resume when you come back. There's a couple of different approaches that you can take to evaluation. We're going to take a look at those now. All right, so one of them, uh, the most basic one, is called the criteria match process. Now, in this case, what we are actually doing is coming up with a list of qualities that you want uh, in whatever it is that you're evaluating. Uh, so you compose a series of criteria as to what determines quality in your mind, and then line up the evaluation subject against those criteria and determine whether it meets those criteria or not. Okay? Now, when you are selecting your criteria, keep in mind that they will be the primary arbiter 
of good or bad in this process. Also, another thing to keep in mind is that a subject does not have to meet all the criteria to be judged as good. Okay? So, let's say you are looking at a particular, a particular film, okay? Uh, if you're familiar with films in the genre, okay, uh, then you're going to have certain expectations of what the genre is supposed to have. Okay, like fantasy films are supposed to have a certain uh, quality to them. They're supposed to uh, elicit certain feelings. They're supposed to have a certain tone to them. Same with science fiction. Same with uh, any kind of genre, dramas, comedies, horror films, anything like that. Okay, so your criteria is going to determine whether that's a quality work of that or not. Okay, for anything that you evaluate, your criteria is going to determine the quality. The met criteria then become the reasonings behind your evaluative argument. So, in other words, this the a number of criteria that it meets are going to be the reason why you uh, say it's either good quality or bad quality. Okay, if it does not meet many of the criteria, then it's not going to be as good as something that meets more of those criteria. Okay. So, for example, we're going to ha use a uh, review. We're going to use movie reviews as examples for a evaluative argument because they're fairly easy to come by. Uh, the first one we're going to take a look at is this one right here. Uh, this is a uh, review of the uh, film Wonder Woman from 2017. Uh, this is a less than serious review that was done by the website how it by the YouTube channel how it should have ended. Uh, if you're familiar with how it should have ended, you know that they like to do cartoony uh, theories of how move, how big blockbuster movies should have ended. Okay, uh, they also started doing movie reviews as well. So uh, this was one of the earlier ones that they've done. Okay, uh, and they also like to do a lot of superhero movies. So uh, we're going to take a look at the how it should have ended review of Wonder Woman. All right, folks, so uh, here is the review itself. Uh, this is listed as a no-spoiler review, so any of you who uh, have not seen this movie yet, uh, that you won't be spoiled. Now, I won't, I won't give you the same promise for the second review you're going to look at today, uh, because that one has a lot of spoilers in it. Uh, but this one, you'll give you an idea of the uh, type of... Uh, the type of thing we're talking about here as far as evaluation goes. Okay, so here we go. Hey everyone, how's it going? I just saw Wonder Woman and I got back and said, man, we got to do another review. What's this you say? Two reviews? So close together? That's not normal. What happened to you? Didn't you used to like make how it should have ended videos? Yes, I've been making how it should have ended videos for 12 years actually and, I'm, and I haven't stopped now. But anyway, I'll update you on that stuff at the end because it's ladies first, homie. And you're not here to listen to me talk about my stuff. You want to talk about Wonder Woman. So what do you say? Let's get to it. Wonder Woman! She's gonna punch the violence out of you. Wonder Woman! And Captain Kirk is her new boo. <clears throat> all right, Wonder Woman. The movie we were all looking forward to, but also expected to self-implode and burst into flames and squeal a depressing, embarrassing death because we had crossed our arms long ago with all this previous Wonder Woman silly business and started to lose faith in this character ever having her own movie is finally here. And guess what? It doesn't suck! It is awesome, actually. DC finally delivers the Wonder Woman you've been hoping for. Directed by Patty Jenkins and written by these three dudes. Huh. It is so good, you guys. It hits so many important beats. If you wanted a timeless origin story, you got it. If you wanted something that makes you excited for Wonder Woman in the Justice League, you got it. If you wanted a strong female role model for the world to look up to, you got it. If you wanted awesome sweet action sequences, you got it. If you wanted a movie that has a great message, you got it! I'm getting really excited, sorry. This is almost a perfect superhero film, and I hesitate saying the word almost. Only because, even though I really appreciated everything that was said and done in this film, there are some things at the end that I would just want a little bit more. But coming from a guy that makes How It Should Have Been videos for a living, I doubt that comes as much of a surprise. So my short review is, guess what? Go check it out. Wonder Woman is classic and beautiful and awesome, 
Gal Gadot. Gadot? Is that how you say it, right? Gal Gadot? That's what I said. She completely has my vote. And honestly, I didn't think I would like her when she was first cast. I thought, yeah, I mean, she's hot and she kind of looks like Wonder Woman, but she's so skinny. I mean, shouldn't Wonder Woman like have muscle tone like an Amazon? And Gal Gadot shows up in this movie and she's like, sit down, you don't know me, kapow. Does all this cool fight choreography and straight up puts me in my place. She's awesome. Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman has arrived and she has raised the bar that the rest of the Justice League will have to live up to, in my opinion. Because in all honesty, Wonder Woman is good enough that it doesn't need the Justice League tie-in. The tie-in is there, but there isn't an overly obvious handoff to the Justice League, and I really like that. There isn't an after credit scene, Warner Brothers is like, Stop expecting this from us. She don't need no stinking after credit scene. So my quick review is, I enjoyed it, go check it out. If you want to talk more details, then let's talk spoilers. Spoiler warning! Spoiler warning! I can't believe Chris Pine becomes Green Lantern at the end. How awesome was that? I'm kidding, that doesn't happen. Sorry. Wonder Woman becomes Green Lantern. I'm kidding. She dies. No, I'm just, that's, okay, whatever. Spoilers ahead, people. What did you think of the backstory? I enjoyed it, duh. Little Diana is growing up on Themyscira, all cute with a desire to punch things. She's surrounded by all these strong female warriors. Her mother's like, no, Diana, you will not be a fighter. It's too dangerous. And then immediately whispers into her sister's ear, train her harder than anyone has ever been trained before, ever. And her sister's like, oh yeah, this is Spartak. Blow. I thought that was cool. And it really sets up who Diana is and where she comes from very well. What do you think about Chris Pine? I thought he was a good choice for Steve Trevor. I thought him speaking in a German accent was kind of weird, uh, but he has a lot of funny parts. I loved how they portrayed the lasso of truth being painful to resist. He's Diana's tour guide to the outside world in a way, so they share a lot of funny bits. But on the non-comical side, I thought they developed the relationship with him and Diana pretty well. Their relationship moves kind of fast, but <clears throat> most movie relationships do. What do you think about the supporting cast? There are a lot of sidekick characters in this movie. They often act only as comic relief, like Steve Trevor's secretary, but there's also his team of war misfits. Is that the proper description? War misfits? That's what they feel like. They all have struggles and have accepted their current way of life, but Diana sort of gives each one of them a sense of purpose, which is pretty cool. Wonder Woman encourages everyone she talks to, even the ice cream guy. You should be so proud. I like that joke a lot. What did you think about the villain? So there's like two evils at play in this movie, which made it interesting. The evil of humanity that Steve Trevor is fighting is represented by the Germans with Dr. Poison and Ludendorff, while Wonder Woman is looking to defeat an even bigger evil, the god of war, Ares. She believes wholeheartedly that she can end all war by killing him, and this adds a really interesting dynamic when she has to face the idea that all mankind is ultimately flawed. Of the three big villains, I'd say that Ares was the most disappointing, and I'd even question if the casting of that role was the right choice. While David Thewlis does Sinister pretty well, he doesn't really come off as godlike to me. And it was really tough to buy him in the role of Ares once the final battle got underway, even with all the fake armor and muscles. To me, he was far more effective as the ghost-like figure that Diana couldn't reach through the window. But he transforms into this Lord of the Rings looking armor and it turns into the usual who can hit each other the hardest fight sequence. Uh, in a lot of ways, the climactic battle scene uh, was the least impressive part to me. But it had its merits. Wonder Woman had to come to terms with the idea that humans might not always deserve to be saved, which was driven home when she stared down Dr. Poison at her most vulnerable. Maybe we don't deserve to be saved, but Wonder Woman believes that we should be saved. One of the scenes from the climax I found most interesting was Steve's goodbye moment with Diana where you can't hear what's being said. He gets on the plane and sacrifices himself to stop the gas from reaching its target, but that's not the interesting part. What's interesting is we don't know the words that were actually said because the sound is dampened from the explosion blast. Then when Diana is fighting Ares, she thinks of the goodbye a second time, only this time, we actually hear the words they are saying. And the words are her screaming, I can do it, whatever it is, I can do it. And he says, no, I can save today. You can save the world. I love you. You are meant to think this is what actually was said 
in that scene. But I think, really, she never heard the real words. And the dialogue we hear is what she believes was said. Diana says a couple times in the movie, what matters is what you believe. And she believes that love is the answer. And that's what gives her the strength to fight on. And I kind of think that's the point. Honestly, more than anything, this movie works so well because they really got the character of Wonder Woman so right. She's the perfect amount of good and passion and power that we've always wanted to see. So even with a cheesy line here and there, Wonder Woman completely sells the rest of this movie. And her moral compass is exactly what we want to see in ourselves and in every human. So seeing someone with such strength and conviction is inspiring. And that was the point. Steve tells her in the film, you can do nothing or something. And I've already tried nothing. There are several scenes in this film where often people are choosing to do nothing when the world is at war and in despair. I don't think Diana has ever tried nothing. She was created with the desire to do something from the very beginning. Even when she was a little girl, she was determined. And that speaks to an audience that has witnessed a lot of hurt in the real world right now. We desperately want a hero that wants to do something about it and will lead the charge. She isn't reluctant, she's unwavering. She points out what is broken and immediately goes to fix it. I think this movie works so well because deep down, we all want Wonder Woman to be real. And isn't that what a superhero movie is supposed to be all about? All right, so uh, here's another little exercise for you guys. Uh, this will be also on Questions of the Professor. Uh, we're gonna make this one a separate thread from the phone thread. Uh, I'm going to have uh, what I would like you guys to do is to tell me what you feel is the criteria that that review had. OK, uh, what did you hear from this reviewer was the uh, marks markers of quality for uh, this film? Uh, you may, as you heard at the very beginning of it, he uh, said that it's uh, close to a perfect superhero movie. Uh, so trying to figure out why he uh, reached that assessment of Wonder Woman uh, based on whatever criteria you can pick out from his review. Uh, I'll give you about uh, 10 minutes to do that and then we'll uh, continue with the lecture.
All right, and we are back. All right, so the next thing to consider here uh, when we're talking about a criteria-based evaluation is some issues that you have to think about regarding criteria when you are working with this type of uh, review or this type of evaluation. Uh, so one th some things to think about here. One is the purpose and context, okay? It's important to keep in mind the context of the subject being evaluated as well as the context and background of the evaluator. The writer's inherent biases and or background will influence the criteria used. Okay, Anything that is going to create an influence on what they feel is a criteria is going to uh, also influence whether they feel the subject is of quality or not. I'll give you an example. Uh, the How Should Have Ended review of Wonder Woman is from the perspective of a superhero fan. Uh, implying he is at the very least familiar with the comic book source material. Uh, I will say if you have never seen any videos from how it should have ended, uh, especially he does a lot of uh, genre films in on that channel where he does little, like I said, little cartoony uh, uh, theor theories on how films should have ended. And almost all of his superhero based ones uh, end uh, with the lead characters of the film uh, having a uh, coffee at a diner, a superhero diner, uh, usually with Batman and Superman. Uh, and they're also all talking about the movie. Okay? Uh, so this guy knows his superheroes. Okay? And he uses them a lot. Alright? So there are some special problems that may also come up in regards to uh, creating your criteria. So one is different classes. Okay? Uh, so subjects should be compared only to other members of their class or category. Do not compare apples to oranges. Okay, uh, This is one thing that people have to be careful about because then it influences your quality assessments. Uh, one a good example of this, again, we can go back to film, criti film critique. When you're coming up with criteria for a film, you have to make sure that you're sticking within conventions of what genre that film is of and what films have come before it in that genre, okay, or even in that particular series. Okay, so uh, example I used to use for evaluation was reviews of the Daniel Craig James Bond films, okay. At least one of them actually had a checklist that the uh, reviewer went down of things that they expect in a Bond film, okay. And uh, the review in question was for the, the film Quantum of Solace, which is like the uh, most atypical James Bond film you could possibly think of. So a lot of the stuff that was on his list of criteria wasn't there, okay? Because it wasn't the typical Bond film. All right, so uh, make sure that you're comparing things on a uh, even uh, keel that you are staying uh, apples to apples, okay? Uh, they have competing standards, perfection versus reality. So be upfront in regards to whether the criteria being used for evaluation is ideal or even achievable, okay? Uh, some people have extremely high standards and are never going to be satisfied, okay? Uh, some people are expecting things that are never going to be present because it's uh, going to be impossible to meet those that goal, okay? So be upfront about it. If you don't think that your goal is, re is realistic, then you need to make the reader understand you're evaluating it based on how close it gets to perfection. Okay? Uh, another thing to keep in mind is seductive empirical methods. Okay? Rationalizing everything into numbers, in other words. Okay? Good evaluations take the non-quantifiable into account in addition to anything that can be quantified. Okay, uh, there is a big temptation to turn arts into sciences, so to speak, and that is you are trying to take a non-quantifiable uh, trait and make it into something quantifiable, make it into something that can be defined with numbers or with charts or with something mathematical. I've always come back to this as a prime example. Uh, there's the uh, film Good, the, the film Dead Poet Society. Okay. Uh, it has a perfect example of somebody trying to do uh, arti artistic value as an empirical number. Uh, the textbook that uh, Robin Williams' English class uses has a preface 
which uh, talks about the way that academics at the time, this is uh, the early 60s, by the way, uh, how academics uh, in English, uh, specifically the ones that were consulted for that particular textbook, uh, came up with their quantification for the quality of the work that was included in it. Okay, And one of the things it describes is a chart, okay, a graph where an X axis is the uh, imagery and the Y axis is the language used. Okay, or excuse me, X axis is the imagery, Y axis is the language used. Okay, the language complexity. Okay, and any, any uh, the quality of the poem could be rated by finding the point on that chart, the point on that graph where uh, it intersected the imagery with the uh, where it intersects the imagery with the language complexity. Uh, needless to say, Robin Williams' uh, teacher character, uh, after declaring that that entire preface is crap, uh, has his students rip out the entire first four chapters of the textbook uh, because they're all using that same uh, de definition of uh, literary quality. Okay? So, again, do not be... Uh, do not be tempted to try to turn uh, something that's non-quantifiable into numbers, okay? Uh, then you have tyranny of cost, okay? This is actually a common fallacy. Uh, the question is, is something automatically better because it's more expensive? Uh, short answer, no, it's not, okay? Uh, there are a lot of examples of extremely expensive things that uh, turned out to be not any better than something that was way cheaper, okay? Uh, not, not exactly related to evaluations, but a good example of this that I was just uh, list, I just heard about recently. Uh, I, I occasionally listen to a podcast called uh, Water Cooled Potato, uh, which deals in uh, weird stories of uh, technology uh, and products that were offered that were like failures of technology. And the most recent episode was talking about a device called the Juicero, which uh, was offered as recently as 2017 before the company went out of business. Uh, the Juicero was a uh, cold press juicer uh, where you were supposed to uh, use packets of pulp, uh, pulp uh, vet fruits or pulp vegetables, stick it in this device, and then it basically had a hydraulic press that would press down on the uh, packets. Uh, and supposedly with the, the amount of force it would take to lift two Teslas, okay? So this was all, supposed to be a lot of force being pushed down on this uh, pulp packet, okay? Just to create a six ounce glass of juice, okay? Uh, the unit itself cost $700. Cost $700. Uh, it apparently cost $1,000 per unit to produce because they were planning on getting their money back from a subscription service for the juice packets. Uh, which ran, ran anywhere from 5 to $8 a piece. So you had to buy them on a weekly, weekly plan, five per week. So at most $40 a week in juice packets. Uh, so it comes out to a little over $2,000 a year that you're spending on these juice packets. Now, where we're getting into tyranny of cost, the fallacy here, uh, a lot of people discovered that the uh, juice packets, you could just as easily juice them by cutting them open and squeezing them with your hand. You didn't need the $700 hydraulic vise to uh, squeeze the juice out. Okay, so uh, keep in mind that not, not everything that's more expensive is going to be better. Okay, don't try not to use how much it's worth, how much it costs, uh, what the cost was in creating it. Don't use any of that as a criteria because it's not necessarily a uh, measure of quality. Okay, uh, another one we have to deal with is the difference between types of criteria, necessary versus sufficient versus accidental, okay? So, the difference between these three. First off, sufficient criteria is baseline or nominal criteria. It is the least that you need to get by, okay? Uh, at the very least, for a car to be acceptable, it has to have four wheels, an engine, a steering wheel, and brakes, okay? Uh, to be acceptable as a moving vehicle. It needs that. That's the least, okay? Uh, so 
when when you start getting into quality, then you're looking at stuff that's necessary criteria, what you feel is acceptable. Uh, so this is not bare minimums. This is what you feel makes it good, okay? More than just useful or more than just acceptable, this is what's going to make it good. So it's not necessarily the same as sufficient, okay? Uh, the, another example here, the, a job which gives you a lot of time for your family but pays nearly nothing can be defi described as necessary but not sufficient because not all criteria are met. To go back to that car uh, analogy, you could have the most luxurious vehicle in the world, but if it doesn't have an engine and can't go, uh, it's necessary but not sufficient. Okay. Uh, then you have accidental criteria. Uh, these are added bonuses which are neither necessary or sufficient, but they're nice to have. Okay. They're not required, but they are an added benefit. Uh, it's something that you feel is a good addition. Okay. Something that uh, really good feels good to have. Okay, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good or bad, but it is something to note that might help it. Okay. All right, so let's talk about developing evaluation arguments. So the development of arguments for evaluation is very similar to classical arguments. Okay, every claim needs to have a reasoning behind it, and it needs evidence to support that reasoning. Okay, so in this case, your, your reasons are going to be your criteria, okay, and you need to show evidence of whether the uh, subject meets that criteria or not. Going one step further than valuation arguments, there is an also an underlying criterion, which is the basis for that claim and reasoning, and should be also additionally be supported by other evidence and arguments, okay. So again, every criterion, every criteria is going to lead to a reason, okay. Uh, your reason is going to be whether uh, the uh, subject meets that criteria or does not meet that criterion, okay? And then you need to present evidence to show why, okay? Now, this is another uh, review that's coming up here, another evaluation of Wonder Woman, okay? Uh, what I'm going to have you guys doing, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we we have the uh, one topic where you're picking out the criterion from the How It Should Have Ended review, okay? In that same thread, I also want you to evaluate this argument, okay? Here's what I want you to look for in this argument. One is a claim and the reason for that claim, okay? What I want you to look mainly for the main claim, okay, of this of this particular review uh, and the reason for that claim. Then I want you to look for evidence to support that reason. Okay, what did what does this reviewer present as the as his uh, facts that support that claim to support the reason? Then the underlying assumption or criterion based on what's presented. Okay, uh, what kind of criteria is this reviewer using to evaluate the movie? And then the evidence or arguments to support the assumption or criterion. Okay. All right, so we're going to look at this particular review. Uh, I will mention that this particular reviewer gets a little salty at times, so uh, you are forewarned. Okay, we're going to look at this review. Also, I mentioned that this uh, reviewer can get salty at times. I should also mention this reviewer is also extremely Scottish. You know, a thought occurred to me when I woke up in my bathtub this morning. I've said before that Marvel might be running out of creative energy after the big blowout of Avengers Endgame, and it makes me wonder if audience interest will start to wane now that most of their favourite characters have been replaced with something... else. But the irony is that just as the MCU might be heading into troubled waters, the DC movies finally seem to be getting their act together. Aquaman was a surprise hit that grossed over a billion dollars worldwide, while Shazam proved to be a winner with critics and audiences. The point is, DC seems to be in a much better place now than it was a few years ago, and a lot of this change in fortune can be put down to the success of Wonder Woman. Most people probably didn't expect much from Wonder Woman when it was first announced. Least of all me. It was another movie in a failing franchise, directed by someone I'd never heard of, starring someone I didn't particularly care about, set during a conflict that most audiences probably know nothing about, and dealing with a character I knew best from the shitty 1970s TV show. Sorry, Linda. 
On paper, Wonder Woman seemed to have everything going against it, but everyone likes an underdog and we were all pleasantly surprised when the movie hit theatres and turned out not to be a complete disaster. In fact, it went on to gross over $800 million worldwide, established Gal Gadot as a leading lady, and helped to resurrect a film universe that seemed to be on its last legs. Well, until Justice League dropped on us like a $300 million turd. Everyone was loving Wonder Woman, and they just couldn't say enough good things about it. But that was then, and this is now, and since the dust has settled, it seems like a good time for me to look back on Wonder Woman and assess it through lenses unclouded by expectations and excitement. Beer goggles and cataracts will have to do. So join me, <coughs> dear viewer, as I thrust deep into Wonder Woman with a comprehensive review, refusing to pull out until I've reached the most satisfying of conclusions. So anyway, in a shocking twist of fate, the God of War started making wars happen, so Zeus created a race of Amazon warriors to help spread peace and love amongst mankind. That's a bit like creating fast food to help spread fitness and healthy eating amongst the fatties. So they get to London and Steve delivers his report to all the generals there, and Diana translates to the intelligence he recovered because she can speak every language on earth apparently. It's worth pointing out that most modern languages are less than a thousand years old, so there's absolutely no way she could know this stuff, but whatever. So they're on their way to France to put a stop to Ludendorff's plans, and they recruit an ethnically diverse team to help them. There's a smooth-talking North African spy, a generically wise Native American, and a drunken Scottish asshole. You know, it's stuff like this that gives my country a bad reputation. Now I have to admit, visually this is a pretty cool scene as Diana forces her way through no man's land, taking everything the German military can throw at her, and ultimately inspiring the Allied soldiers to launch an attack of their own to liberate the village. It makes you feel nice things deep inside, but then you stop to think about it with your actual brain for a second, and you realise it's all a bit pointless. Like, why waste your time and effort fighting the Germans head on when they're not even your real enemy? You're just gonna stir up another huge battle that'll cost thousands of innocent lives. I mean, do you really think the German military would allow a major breach of their front line without trying to counterattack and close the gap? This is exactly why World War I battles were so costly and pointless. Even if you made it across no man's land and captured the front line enemy trenches, there would be like five more defensive lines waiting for you right behind. Plus, they'd just launch a counterattack and push you right back out again. And what's with Diana's wildly varying power levels? This woman is strong enough to lift a tank and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Superman, but she's stopped in her tracks by machine gun fire. Really? So they follow Ludendorff to a nearby military base, where the poison gas is being loaded into a long-range bomber. This reminds me of the climax for another movie set in another war, but at least that one was kind of plausible because technology was advanced enough to make it feasible. Anyway, Diana finds Ludendorff and they have probably the most one-sided fight in cinema history, an immortal, indestructible demigod versus an elderly German man on steroids. Guess who wins? The problem is that killing him doesn't end the war. People just carry on like nothing happens. What kind of flim-flammery is this, sir? Now Diana's confused because she thought Ares was corrupting humanity to make them fight each other, but it turns out humans are just assholes and war is kind of what we do. War. It's fantastic. So the movie ends with Diana in the present day, deciding to be Wonder Woman again, fighting cruelty and injustice with renewed hope and optimism. Shame she doesn't know what's coming next. And that's it, that's the plot of Wonder Woman. Before I really get into my criticism, I will say there are a lot of things this movie gets right. The casting of Gal Gadot was a brilliant choice. She's beautiful and natural in the role. She seemed to capture Diana's sense of wonder, innocence and optimism, and she actually seems like a genuinely good and humble person that you can't help but warm to, unlike someone I could name. Patty Jenkins really seems to understand her limitations as an actress, and she works around them pretty effectively, allowing her more experienced co-stars to do most of the heavy lifting. And there's a decent chemistry between her and Pine, although for some reason he's picked up a stutter in this movie that really boils my piss after a while. What are they doing? I don't know! I don't know. I, I, Ares I know is dead. Because, I, that's because maybe it's them! I, oh, I, I, Ares I is dead. 
Jesus Christ, man, just spit it out. Anyway, it makes me laugh that they gave everyone on Thermoskira an Israeli accent rather than try to make Gal Gadot speak like an American. <laughs> Diana at least has a good character arc. She goes from a naive and sheltered young woman who sees only the best in humanity to a wiser but ultimately sadder character who's experienced the worst aspects of mankind. But ultimately she regains her faith that there's something noble in the human spirit that's worth fighting for. Most of the action scenes are well shot and there's enough downtime and character moments in between to pace things out. The dialogue is passable, there are some decent jokes even if it lacks the slick wittiness of the Marvel movies, but at least it's not as dull and pretentious as the Zack Snyder films. There are problems with Wonder Woman though, and most of them revolve around the script. The villains' motivations are muddled and confused, constantly trying to bend themselves around whatever's actually happening in the story, and usually they end up contradicting themselves and undermining the film's message. Ludendorff and Dr. Poison are pretty dull as secondary antagonists, which is a shame because they're played by good actors who could do a lot more if they had better material to work with. The village people wannabes also had the potential to be good. But aside from Samir, they never really do anything useful. The Scottish guy is the absolute worst example. He's got PTSD and he can't bring himself to shoot anyone, so you might think his plot arc would be about learning to overcome his fear and fight to save his friends at a crucial moment, but you'd be wrong. He's just as much of a useless arsehole by the end as he was at the start. What's a waste of time? The final battle seemed like it was going to do something interesting until it disintegrated into a mindless, overblown, ridiculous CGI mess where I couldn't even tell what was going on half the time. I also couldn't tell you how Diana actually defeated Ares in the end. It's not like she found some hidden flaw in an otherwise unstoppable enemy and used it to turn the tables on him. She just kinda blasted him and then he was gone. Wonder Woman clearly wants to say something about the conflicted nature of humanity, our destructive impulses versus our capacity for bravery and sacrifice. It just doesn't know exactly what it wants to say or how to get it across. What you're left with instead is a superficially charming film with good intentions that knows how to pull all the right emotional strings but ultimately misses the mark because its script just isn't smart enough to deal with the weighty philosophical themes it tries to address. Honestly, I think most of us were so amazed that it wasn't a steaming pile of garbage that we were willing to overlook its flaws and just enjoy it for what it was. The problem is that what it was got consistently blown out of proportion in our collective minds until the film ultimately took on a reputation that it didn't quite deserve. Did I hate it? Not at all. In fact, I like it a lot more than most movies of its kind. But it's my job to drink and to criticise as honestly as possible. And now that I've done one, it's time to get cracking on the other. Oh, and that's all I have for today. Go away now. Alright, so we're going to take... Uh, we'll give you about ten minutes to uh, try to pick out uh, what his... Uh, claim was about the film, uh, the evidence that he uses to support that, uh, the underlying assumption or criteria based on what's presented, and then the evidence or arguments to support the assumption or criterion. Uh, take about 10 minutes, and then we'll come back to it.
All right, and we're back here. Now, uh, there's one other uh, evaluation example that I wanted you guys to take a look at. Uh, I'm going to set up a third thread on the questions of the professor to handle this one. Okay, so uh, what we have is a uh, example of a student doing an evaluation. Uh, it's on eCampus below the slides uh, for this week. Uh, this is an essay that was written by a student named Jackie Wingard. Okay, and in this case, Jackie Wingard, I believe, was attending the University of Washington. Uh, and she's evaluating a museum called the Experience Music Project. It's also known as EMP. This is a museum in Seattle. Uh, it is part of the uh, it's part of the Seattle Music of Pop Museum of Pop Culture. Okay, so what I want you to do here, uh, and we're not going to pause the lecture for this one. We'll let you guys do this for uh, uh, once once we get through through the lecture here. Uh, because it does require a bit of reading. I want you to look through Jackie's essay. We will want you to read it critically and then answer these questions. I'm going to post them to, I'm going to post the questions in the thread. Okay, just so you have a reminder. So, first question How does Jackie Wingard compare the EMP facility to the criteria presented? Uh, she has a particular set of criteria she wants to use for her review. So, uh, how does she compare it? Uh, second, pick out the reasons why the EMP does or does not meet a criteria according to Wingard. Okay, uh, what specific uh, reasoning does she have for make, giving it a pass on that criteria or saying that it doesn't meet it? Okay, uh, then the third part of this could require a little bit of legwork on your part. I want you to do some online research on EMP. Now, without any in-person experience with EMP, would you agree with Jackie Wingard's evaluation and why or why not. Okay, so based on any information that you can find online, I would run a Google search for the EMP. Okay, uh, and make sure you actually do it in context with Seattle Museum of Pop Culture because EMP has a number of other uh, connotations. Uh, one, one, the one I'm most familiar with is uh, electromagnetic pulse. Okay, uh, you just, you want to be more, very specific about which EMP you're looking for. Okay, so uh, once we're done with the lecture here, I uh, want you to go ahead and take a look at that review, or take a look at that evaluation, and uh, answer these questions. All right, so that gets us to the evaluative argument assignment, okay? Uh, this is the uh, evaluation that you're going to be doing and you're going to be choosing what you evaluate. Okay. Now, your evaluative argument, I say, will be due on October 22nd. I believe it's actually going to be the 23rd. I'm going to double check this. Uh, yeah, it's going to be 23rd. Okay. So it'll be due on October 23rd at midnight. Okay. Uh, two workshops for that. Uh, the week of October 12th will be the revision workshop. Okay. Uh, just like we did this last time, the, the, you'll be able to workshop it the entire week. And then the week of October 19th, which is the week that's due, uh, you will also have another week to do that. That's going to be a proofreading and editing workshop. Okay? Now, you will be writing an evaluation into, of a particular subject. Okay? There's no requirements in terms of what you evaluate, but it has to be something you have good familiarity with, something that you have experienced and have at least some uh, measure of you know what it is intimately. Okay. For instance, if you choose to evaluate a film, you should have watched the film at least twice to give a fair evaluation. Okay. Uh, if you're if you're doing something like reviewing a hotel or reviewing a theme park or reviewing a restaurant or something like that, you have to have experienced it at least I would say at least twice to be fair. Okay. Now, as part of this assignment, you should have a clear set of criteria for your evaluation. Now, when you turn the uh, essay in, I will be asking that you include that list of criteria along with your drafts when you turn it in. Okay? So the very first thing you should be doing with this assignment is creating your list of criteria. The essay requirements for this, the, the nuts and bolts of it, uh, it should be three to five pages in length. Uh, should, again, double spaced, 11 to 12 point font, uh, acceptable fonts, Times Roman, Arial, or Calibri. 
Uh, just again, as a reminder, uh, there's only four acceptable file formats that you can turn these in is. So make sure that your file is in one of those four acceptable formats. Now, a works cited page is not going to be required for this essay as your evaluation should only have a single research source, that being the evaluation subject. Okay. However, if you do further research, a works cited page is going to be recommended. Okay. So you don't have to have one, but uh, if you do further research beyond just your subject, then you're going to need it. Okay. The evaluation should be organized so that your criteria for evaluation can be determined from the context of your writing. Okay, so I shouldn't have to rely on your list of criteria to figure out exactly what your criteria are. The list is going to be there just to make sure that you are using it. Okay, when you present your evaluation in the essay, we should have a clear idea of what your, evalu your evaluation criteria are. Okay. All right, uh, and so that will do it for this week. Uh, so go ahead and get started with this for this week. Uh, as usual, keep up with MindTap, keep up with the uh, weekly discussion boards. Uh, if you have not yet turned in your uh, classical arguments, you have until the end of this week in order to turn it in for full credit, as I said before. Uh, and think, Right now, I do want you guys to be thinking about what you want to do, what you want to evaluate. Uh, make sure also that you do those the exercises in the uh, from this lecture that they are posted questions to the professor. Now, I don't really grade those, but they are really good for practice and they're really good for getting your head head in the right spot for doing this particular essay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, that being said, uh, we'll do another. Uh, We'll do another collaborate session on Thursday. Uh, probably uh, during that session, we will be reading the Jackie Wingard essay. Uh, and with all that being said, I will uh, see you guys then. Uh, thanks for watching. And I'll see you again next time.